Okay, please welcome again, Sir Jacques. We don't have a lot of time, so if you could make your questions as precise as possible, we have a rare opportunity to have a, such an expert with us. So. But as you follow your questions, let me say one thing. Uh, most of you must get films are very much in the men's domain, and they don't have very good uh, women's characters portrayed. Uh, so this one is, uh, despite me, probably you've seen this film, the strongest female character ever portrayed in a film. So, there you go. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wanted to say that there's some very fine films in this festival, and many of us really appreciate the opportunity to find out about developments in the history and culture of Turkey. So if we wanted the most up-to-date technological films, we could be at the multiplex. So we really appreciate this uh, historical retrospective. Um, I have a couple quick questions. In some of the films where we're seeing smuggling over the border, I'm wondering whether this is the, um, the Iraqi border or the Syrian border. And a second question, in many of the films, there's sort of what I take to be subtle um, references to the, um, the peasant workers that are coming to the mills or to the fields as perhaps being the Kurdish minority people but that it's not sort of blatantly <coughs> referred to because we know that the okay, differences okay. were downpedaled. Is that yeah. so? Two questions. First, when the theme of smuggling is in the films, uh, where are they smuggling to or from? And second, uh, in terms of some of the workers, uh, is it really the, a Kurdish minority that's really being kind of addressed? And uh, are the audiences, would the audiences in Turkey realize that? Well, that's a very interesting question. First of all, this film was made in central Turkey, where Cappadocia is, and so it is not really made in, um, because of it, I think you've seen the, the photogenic qualities. You can say that Yilmaz Gune face launches a thousand rocks. <laughs> um, I think smuggling, not per se smuggling, most of the smuggling was done and still is being done in the southeastern part of Turkey, uh, but it was a lifestyle uh, because nothing was available uh, for the villagers of these parts. And it was a it was a way of life, and it wasn't the way in the last 78 years. It was the way for uh, hundreds of years. This was a very nomadic style of uh, of what you might say, potluck type, go and get to grab the stuff uh, to to sustain your life. Actually, it wasn't a you know a commercial activity in the in the general electric general motor sense. And the second question was about the Kurdish minorities, the workers that we've seen in some of the films. Uh, Kurds are uh, quite dispersed in the population. We cannot talk about a particular Kurdish area. Um, as a matter of fact, the largest Kurdish city in the world is Istanbul. Yes? Uh, I've noticed in both Elegy and some of the other films that um, we only see sort of modern day technology, like in this film we see the guitar, um, sort of on the peripheral, while most of these narratives seem to almost take place like 30, 40 years in the past. Is there a certain cultural idea in Turkey to do these films, you know, not set in modern day Istanbul, to set them sort of in these other areas of Turkey? Kind of a mixed sense of time sometimes where we get stories that seem to happen a long time ago, or could happen a very long time ago, next to images of modern technology like threshers or automobiles or things like that. I think the the technology available to the Turkish filmmakers are not like Americans. You can walk into a warehouse called 1940 and find packaging from 1940s and everything. And because of this, in some films, you might not realize, but there are a lot of anachronistic things that crept into it. They use whatever they can find. Uh, it is very difficult to make historical films, but recently, because of the uh, importance of films made for TV, they are making very accurate historical films. So they're creating this type of art direction, which wasn't available. I mean, some of these films were made in a very short period of time. How many films did Gune make this year, the year that he made this film? Well, it's 1971. Gune released about five to six films. And this was a year when uh, there was a coup in 1971, and um, he ended up in prison again. Uh, not related to his filmmaking activities for uh, aiding and abetting some um, sort of Marxist students, uh, hiding them in his, uh, in his mansion, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
But you must realize that he's one of the most incarcerated filmmakers in the world. Out of the 26 years that he was able to make films, 12 of them he spent in prison, and uh, two in the military service and three in exile. So it was a life very sparing to use. Mind you, uh, we will see the next film, we'll get into that goal. Uh, during the making of this uh, film and some four other films, basically he used the prison almost like his filmmaking production office and people were able to visit them and make German um, camera crews would come and make documentaries about his life. His producers would call him anytime he wants, his, his Swiss producer. So it's, it's very different. It is really not the turkey of uh, Midnight Express. Yes. Yes. Uh, on third two films, particularly uh, the movie, uh, the social justice, the class struggle, the theme is very pronounced. And also, it's very summer and, uh, and what was the other one? Revenge of the States. But uh, I was wondering, is that was that a pronounced theme during the 60s and 70s? It, a lot of 60s and 70s films, as you were saying, the ones he's seen, there's a real theme of class struggle, and was that something that was typically found in Turkish films? Well, uh, 1960 was a very, is again, very interesting year. Uh, there was a military coup in 1960, and uh, they toppled the government saying that you disregard the, uh, the Constitution, and then just to legitimize this coup, they did rewrite a new, uh, new Constitution. But this Constitution uh, created a lot of uh, social ideas, it was a very advanced, I'm not saying that this is an excuse for, uh, for a military coup, but in, in those years people start making films with these kind of themes. They found this, this faith in the constitution, which has since, since changed, but Turkey is now in the process of writing another constitution, really, uh, in an American sense. A constitution that doesn't protect the state from the people, but protects the people from the state. So hopefully uh, there will be more social justice in Turkey. Can I ask you, in a film like Umut, which we just screened uh, the other day, uh, that and other films, there seems to be a kind of, sometimes disregard, sometimes even a kind of satirization of religion. And I'm wondering, how would that have been taken in Turkey in 19, whenever Umut came out? Uh, would that have seemed shocking to people? Well, this was one of the agendas of the new Turkish Republic. Uh, this was based on some French ideas of, of laicism, and of course, uh, Turkey do not have this type of a, of a religious background where people had a fight with the religion, but it does creep into the, the, the work of uh, Turkish intellectuals. People are not like that. They are very respectful of their religion. Other questions? Uh, there's someone who's back first. Let me get that person, yeah. Yes, Jamshi. Yeah, I was wondering if this movie would be considered a conventional film and also, if you speak to the symbolism of the falling rocks, especially within a Turkish context. Two questions. First, about um, would this be a commercial or more of an art house film in a Turkish context? And the second is the symbolism of the falling rocks. Okay. Uh, it's an excellent question. As I mentioned in my introduction, uh, Turkey did not have a film industry. These films were produced basically by having advances from the distributors from different parts of the country, and distributors might even ask them that certain actors would be in, they would be kissed so many times, and they would be involved in so many fights. Obviously, the only way for Turkish filmmakers to make more films was to make their films commercially successful. These films did coincide in a period where what we call the spaghetti westerns were quite popular in Turkey. So most uh, Turkish films, they had to be commercially successful so they can make, make other films. So they made it very appealing to, to the people. But I think also Turkish directors, in terms of art house films, they were reading uh, their public. And this was a pre-television times in Turkey. There was a very high level of attendance to the films. And uh, yes, they were made with commercial intentions, made with, um, with the ideas to, to, to make money. But today we can talk about a, a certain type of filmmaking in Turkey. Some of them are like blockbusters, like the last week there was some 1453 playing around the United States. But then again, art house films, films geared for basically a festival screening or the festival circuit and not necessarily for commercial success in, in Turkey. But again, some of those directors, they make their money in advertising industry and they, they carry these art films as most like a hobby.
but then the technology is advanced, and I'm sure, uh, you know, the films you've seen, none of these rocks were CGI, they were really falling. I'm still amazed, I watched this film many times, and I can't get over this, how did they make it? It's amazing, just with just that one. And at this point, you leave all the social ideas and who you name us and everything, and you become a true um, a, a film lover, and you can't get your eyes off the screen and, and watch this tremendous sort of rock symbolism that's happening you know, in, the, in, the, in the end of the film. I think, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a dramatic device. It helps the film. And, but I'm still amazed, like, how did they pull this, this thing? It's, it's unbelievable. Any other questions? Yes, in the back there. is comparing this film to a recent film about a, a Kurdish girl raised by a judge? Right. Uh, of course, in this film, uh, this was almost like 12 years ago, the film was made, and Turkey was going through uh, being able to speak Turkish, and, and the judge would understand a young girl speaking Turkish. Uh, I think it was very important. Uh, also, it was important that a, a, a woman Turkish film director made this film, and. Uh, Things are very different today, so you can't make this kind of a film. But also, I think this film was made to be also critical to the certain elites and the judges and, and people, how they do not respond to the basic needs of the, the certain uh, populace in Turkey. And I think, I mean, today, for example, in the recently wrapped up Istanbul Film Festival, there were three Turkish films with 100% Kurdish themes about language issues and, and how they're trying to recover this, this sort of this lost connection to their um, heritage. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we have time for because we've got another show coming in. Uh, perhaps Erju would be in the uh, lobby for a little bit answering questions, but again, thank you very much for doing thank, this session. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. It cost him 25 years to do this, so he needs the applause. Thank you.